evening, good afternoon, whenever you happen to be listening to me. Welcome to Season 1 of Patriot to the Core. Uh, I am Thad Forster, and I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, I'm looking forward to introducing the guest today, who is a good friend of mine, Michael Andrew. Uh, Mike is a unique individual. Uh, we'll, we uh, want to talk about uh, some of his business failures, uh, what he does as a profession lightly, and, but most importantly, really what he does to serve others. Uh, he's a great humanitarian. Uh, he travels the world responding to natural disasters, and he's been to multiple locations around the globe. I think his volunteer work of this capacity started as uh, when he lived in, in Alabama, which is where we met, and we, we, we went and did some service in response to Hurricanes Ivan and Katrina and maybe some other storms that happened to have come through over the, the years that he lived in Tuscaloosa. So, Mike, it's a great to have you back. Thanks for joining us. How you doing, Thad? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm, I'm okay. Good to, good to hear from you. It's been a while since it, we've talked. It, it has been, yeah. We are, you know, for being such good friends, we don't get to see each other much, but you're all the way in Hawaii and in Maui, and I'm here in Alabama, so that kind of makes things a little difficult. Time zones has, have messed up many relationships for me with many different people. You know, I think you're five hours ahead of me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think you, you've had a lot of interesting uh, life experiences, and so I'm really excited to have you on the podcast because uh, the purpose of you know Patriot to the Core podcast is to highlight great you know, humanitarians, great patriots, and people who just are selfless and not only love this country, but maybe show that um, patriotism not only by maybe serving the country like in the military, but also by serving others whether they're other Americans or whether they're just human beings across the world. And, and so you've been, you are a great example of that. Um, you're a photography instructor by profession. I think that's how you make most of your money yeah. uh, working for yourself, but you also uh, do some volunteer work. And I just wanted you to tell us about that. Well, first let me say thank you. I'm very flattered that you would consider me such. Um, I, I'm looking forward to your podcast and, and many of the people that I know you want to have on there. I, I'd be fascinated to hear, you know, their stories and the things that they do. But uh, just thank you so much. I'm very honored to to be on a podcast. It's, you know, it's not something a lot of people ask me about, but it it kind of gives me a chance to kind of uh, I don't know give give an idea of what's involved in a disaster. There are some people out there who are going to be interested. There are some things that people do not know that um, they should know, you know, before it happens. But in, in regards to your question, photography, uh, basically I teach online. Um, I call myself M Michael the Maven online and I have a YouTube channel under the name Michael the mentor. And essentially I teach beginning photographers. So if they get a camera, maybe it's a Canon or a Nikon and they've never used it and they're struggling to learn their camera. I basically have lessons online that they can watch and that's how I make a living. And that has been directly related to my ability to go on volunteer trips because I can take time off from that work for, you know, weeks or even months at a time if I need to and just set work aside and volunteer. And so the only reason I can volunteer is because of the structure of, of how I work. So they go hand in hand. I have a lot to be thankful for the way things ended up. I originally wanted to be a doctor, a uh, surgeon, and I was in grad school and just I was doing a PhD project, didn't work, and I kind of had to rely on the, the three things that I was really good at at the time, which was teaching, photography, and video, and I, that's when I put them together and started this business. Yeah, and before that business, you, you had several other business adventures. I mean, I, I was there when you, not when you started a, a company in college, but while you were in the early days of it, when you started uh, college here in Alabama, and I remember helping you put the, put the <laughs> stickers on the, the tag, you know, for brag tags. What, what were some of the, the businesses that you started? Oh man, I have started and failed at many different businesses. Uh, that business, brag tags, that was uh, college licensed dog tags with the logos of the, of the school mascots on them. And uh, I started that right at the end of my undergrad, and we would sell them for like five or six bucks or something. But the problem with that was in, in order to make a profit, you had to make like hundreds of them. 
and then sell them at the football games. And, and it, it was, I learned a lot about business from that, but I also learned that you can have a cool business that's not necessarily profitable. You know, it was a cool product. It was a cool idea, but it didn't really make a lot of money. And so that business eventually fizzled out. Um, I, I did pools, cleaned a lot of swimming pools during my time in Alabama. And, um, after some time, I realized I, I should always be calculating how much money I'm making per hour give, with any given job. And the pool job kind of translated into wedding videography, which translated into wedding photography. And that's kind of how, you know, I was jumping around from business to business, but it all had to do with how much money I was making per hour on each of those jobs. And so some of it was just failure related. And some of it was like, you know what? I'm not making enough money for my time doing this. I'm going to try something else. So it's all good. Uh, you know, I've learned the most from the failures in my businesses. I've, I've had all kinds of things happen. I've made apps that uh, we made a contract making app for photographers and it's been ripped off, you know, 25 times within the first year of that coming out. And there's competition out there, you know, but I've, I've kind of learned what my competitive strengths are and I've kind of built on them and I've been able to find a niche. And so I'm very thankful and lucky. Yeah, and, and before your your current business kind of really got stabilized, I mean, you had some financial struggles, didn't you? Oh, completely. I was. I won't go into details, but it was about as bad as it could get. You know, I I it was right when I was um, trying to finish a PhD, so I had I'd been five years into a PhD program, and I learned that my my research wasn't supporting. <laughs> the theory I had in my committee told me I needed to start over. That was probably the most brutal blow I, I took during that time because it was, I'd worked on it for five years. They said I needed to start over. Maybe I could be finished in about three years. And at that point I had to make a decision if I wanted to, you know, get a PhD or just quit and start working. And I had been in grad school at that time, eight years. And I was, I was just done, you know? Um, and so when I quit that, I lost obviously my financial support for my scholarship that I had and I had to move out. I was so broke at that time. I had to live with Mike Madsen, who you know, and just out of the kindness mm -hmm. of his heart, he just let me live with him for it was about five or six months. And that's when the business really started is because I could focus all my time and energy on making these training videos, you know, all day, every day I was just making training videos and it just, I just got lucky. I found something that worked and it stuck and I just worked really hard at growing it. So, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was about as bad as it could possibly get financially. I mean, I think about it now. I'm just, I'm like surprised. I, I lived through that without filing for bank bankruptcy. Yeah. And I don't think I had a clue, you know, how bad it was. Obviously you weren't going around broadcasting it. Uh, you I mean, we could, we could spend a whole, episode just talking about your your business ventures i think and the ups and downs and uh definitely more ups now i believe uh, but i want to talk about your roles in disaster in disasters uh mm -hmm. you know really you know what do you do how did you get started in this in this uh, these relief efforts and you know what countries have you volunteered in and you know what do you specifically do on the ground at these disasters so that's a very good, these are all great questions. They're very long. I'll try to keep it to the point. Um, basically what happened in Haiti was after the earthquake in Haiti, and I was seeing these images of the kids crying and, and realizing that the aid was just too slow. I kind of felt like here I am a grown man, abled, healthy. I have a little bit of money and I'm not doing anything really. I'm just working. You know, I don't have a family. I don't have kids. And so I try to look for opportunities to have a meaningful impact on society. And I, I just felt overwhelmed that I needed to pack my bags and go to Haiti. It was something, it would not go away. It would not leave me alone. And, um, almost like I would be ashamed if I didn't do it. And that's what I did. I went to the store, uh, packed my bags with camping gear and everything I thought I needed and basically jumped on a plane without a, a contact in Haiti or no, any plan really. We had an idea that, you know, we could help some orphanages maybe, but we didn't know anybody there. And, um, one of my blog subscribers, uh, kind of, he met me in Orlando and thank goodness traveled with me. It would have been a nightmare without him. But, you know, I think back now it was tremendously dangerous 
to do that. I do not recommend people jump on a plane and go to a disaster situation without having some contacts or knowing, you know, what they're going to be doing. We sometimes refer to them as disaster tourists. Sometimes people just want to go to see the disaster firsthand and then they turn around and leave. They're not really doing anything. And um, disaster tourists kind of get in the way. Yeah. Uh, they're a liability. You know, there there's lots of chaos and sometimes they go and they get hurt or robbed and they be, they become a problem, a burden on the system that's trying to help. But anyway, we went to Haiti. Long now, this was the first you went to yes. Haiti twice, right? So this is the first yes. time. This was the first time. And this is in is this 2010? This is 2010 right after the earthquake. Okay. Within, within about I think it was like uh within the first week I think we were there. So the first two or three days I was thinking about it and by the third or fourth day I was packing and finally got the uh ticket and went. Um we long story short was we hooked up initially with the Salvation Army. They told us to leave. They didn't want us there and half of the people that I had kind of met on the way, they left and I just kind of decided to stay and help these orphanages. And through time I was able to earn the trust of the Salvation Army and eventually started working with them. And um, that's kind of how it got started. I was there for three weeks and we, we, what we would do was we'd go out and we'd find orphanages that were not getting help. GPS tagged their location and do something called an assessment. It's where you find out how many people they have, what do they need? You know, who's in charge? But the important thing was as I was GPS tagging the location. So we knew exactly where it was, even if there wasn't a street address and I was taking pictures. And so when I brought the pictures back and I was showing the Salvation Army, I had proof that I wasn't, you know, there to, as a disaster tourist. I was there to actually help and I was a hard worker. And that's when they started saying, OK, well, we're not supposed to do this, but we're going to give you some food you can take out to them. Or we're going to give you some tents. And so. We found ourselves sneaking food and tents out, you know, sometimes at night in Haiti, which is a really bad idea because there's there's a lot of riots, there's a lot of looting, there's people, you know, there were some aid workers who were killed. Um, but what I do now essentially is I go out as a scout. So when there's a really, really bad disaster, um, typically there needs to be about a thousand people. I'm just ballparking this. About a thousand people dead within 24 hours is a pretty good indicator to me. Okay. That it's time. It's time to go. Um, I'm in contact with the Salvation Army, and I have my own aid group, which is called Red Lightning. But um, I work a lot with the Salvation Army because they have tremendous resources, uh, very knowledgeable. They're trained. They know what they're doing, and so I usually go in with their disaster team. You know, I'm sta I'm stationed in basically Hawaii, and so. When something bad happens, I start communicating with the international disaster aid responder, the lead, and we make a decision whether or not we're going to go in or not. Um, but anyway, what I do, my basic specialty is to find pockets of people who are not getting aid. So well, what happens is, you know, in the cities, it's easy to find people who need help. But what about the people who live out in the hills or the mountains or on a different island, you know, hiking 10 hours or whatever it is to, to find these people. So my job is to find these pockets of smaller sized cities and groups to GPS tag them, to assess their needs, what they need, uh, you know, how to get it to them, try to figure out a pipeline to get the aid to them. And that's basically what I do is I'm a, dis I'm a disaster aid scout. That's pretty much it. So, and Mike, you're, you're a, a physically fit guy. You're, um, you know, you're, well above the average size male and you know you speak with authority you act like you know what you're doing so you know have you i mean i think you've been mistaken people there think you are an official authority mm -hmm. some of them think you're military i mean really what's your interaction like with the locals and how do they how do they and the the the, the official uh, disaster aid folks kind of receive you and treat you well initially it was it was as an outsider. This, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, you know, Salvation Army. But I think now um, I've learned that basically when a disaster hits, the majority of the people who have lived through it are going to have a victim mentality. Okay, like I have suffered. And many of them have. Most of them have. You were, Their homes are gone or loved ones are dead or they're injured or they're penniless. Um, and so the victim role 
is something that happens a lot in disasters is that you have people who have lost nothing who still think they're the victims. It's, it's really fascinating. Hmm. Uh, there are, there is always a group of people. I don't know. I think every, everybody in a disaster zone, they go through this transition from being a victim to being, I'm going to take care of myself. But it's, it's that some individuals make that transition very early on and they become the leaders, you know, of the group. Uh, what I try to do is work with a local, if, if we're with the Salvation Army, they have a, usually a local Salvation Army church or whatnot. But in some cases, like the Philippines and Japan, we didn't have those contacts and connections. And so I tried to find the local leader who was taking charge and basically mentor him or her in, in what they need to do in the disaster response. I'd be like their advisor, their consultant, you know, so... Uh, in Japan, there was a group who had all the resources but no experience in disaster aid, and so I basically said, "This is this is how you should do it, and this is where you can get this, and this is you know the process." And eventually, you know, they developed. It's fascinating to watch these individuals accept the role of being a leader, and then it's just how far do you want to take this? There is unlimited opportunities to do good in a disaster zone and that's that's super encouraging because in business you know sometimes you fail and sometimes you make it you know in social relationships sometimes there's problems or mm -hmm. you know sometimes your sports team loses or whatever it is but the, the beauty of a disaster is if you go there with the intention of helping you absolutely positively will be successful you know and, and there is unlimited opportunity for that kind of service is to help people so that's what it, you know, every time I go, I, you know, something will happen or I'll do something new. And, and I say to myself, okay, how, how far can I take, how much good can we do here? What's the biggest impact? And there are opportunities for those leaders to step up and take charge and say, okay, well, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to move 12 tons of food here. And we're going to do it by truck or by boat or by carrying it. And it's super, um, it's thrilling to be in those kinds of situations. It is. That's that's the best way I can describe it. It's just thrilling. Well, and you captured a lot of these experiences in your book, Three Weeks in Haiti. Uh, it's available on Amazon. I've read it. I read it shortly after it came out a few years ago. Actually, I guess it came out around 2011. Is that right? Yeah, it took some time for me to actually get around to writing it. Um, yeah, it was about a year, year and a half later, something like that. Okay. Well, I mean, one thing that you do what topic you capture in that book is the dangers that you experience in Haiti. And I mean, so I'd like to, to you to talk about the dangers and maybe, maybe in Haiti, maybe in other countries too, other places that you've been, what did you encounter and you know, how close it, how threatened did you feel? You know, all that, all that interesting stuff. Every disaster I have gone to, I have nearly lost my life uh, doing something in Haiti. Uh, we were, coming back from a delivery late at night and there was martial law at the time it was like 10 or 10 30 and we got pulled over by a haitian swat team and uh they basically lined us up you know with machine guns and and everything and they i was kind of hiding in the back of the truck we had this little beat up truck and they you know they, the drivers were swearing we were on a disaster aid thing and they wanted to see me and they brought me out and they i mean to have somebody point a machine gun right at your head it it really commands your attention, you know. So that was one time we were pretty nervous. Um, they had killed some some guys that Haitian SWAT team for whatever reason. Maybe they were looters. I don't know. But uh, we were, we were real nervous. Then we had a drug dealer jump in the back one night. We shouldn't even been driving around at night, but you know sometimes it was the only way to get things done. And this guy was smuggling drugs around, and he wouldn't get out of our truck. You know, we were unarmed. It, that was pretty nerve wracking. Um, I was worried about the radiation in Japan, you know, the fallout. And I had to like look on maps to see which way the cloud was blowing to, to avoid it. And eventually had a, a radiation detector come in and I'd wear this thing. And, uh, in the Philippines, I was super dehydrated. I had to have an IV for about three days, man. That was terrible. That was like the worst. <laughs> Um, actually Vanuatu, we didn't, I didn't really run into too much trouble there in terms of danger, but I was told by the locals that a hundred years earlier they were cannibals. And, um, 
There were <laughs> there were stories in their culture of eating missionaries. And then uh, in Nepal, um, you know, I posted that video on YouTube of the second earthquake. We were out maybe 10 miles away from that epicenter and hiking in these Himalayan mountains, basically. And the mountains just started coming down. And that was a, we had been dropped off earlier in the morning, you know, by helicopter. So there was no easy way out of there. It's the helicopter drops you off and they say, okay, be at this GPS coordinate in 10 hours kind of thing, you know? And we just lucked out. We just got lucky to be on this one hill where the other mountains were having landslides and we just so happened to be on, on the right hill at the right time, you know? Um, that, that was, was in, that was incredible footage. You, you actually captured that on video. You posted it on your website. Yeah. Uh, I, I viewers or listeners, you need to watch that video, Mike. I mean, that that was really good. The video is called "Landslides in Sindapalchuk." Uh, Sindapalchuk's the the area that we were working in, and and uh, yeah, we just that I was really scared then because. Uh, the Himalayan mountains are relatively young, and so landslides are common out there. But the area that we were in, um, there are landslides all the time. There's a whole city that was gone. Uh, it, basically, mountain fell on this whole city, 500 people dead. You know, they never found the bodies. And there's stories of this guy who was in his truck, and he was texting his friends. He had been, you know, hitting a landslide. They couldn't find the guy. You know, never found him. And we weren't sure if the if the hill that we were standing on was going to fall away any second. You know, that's kind of the feeling. You know, you feel like you're on a giant landmine that's about to explode. But we were, when the helicopter came, we were ready to kiss it. You know, to to get the heck out of yeah, there. But yeah. It was it, that was a very stressful day, but otherwise interesting. I'm I I feel somewhat protected while I'm out there while I'm working. But I know that if if something bad happens to me, it was doing a good thing and. And I can live with that, you know. I've made my peace with that if, if it were to happen. So, yeah. so what would you say is really your motivation for doing this volunteer work? Um, fulfillment to serve. I it's somewhat somewhat kind of selfish, I guess, but I I feel most relevant serving my fellow man. You know, the the daily grind isn't it's very unsatisfying to me personally. You know, making money and working and eating and sleeping that's very low level satisfaction for me but when you go into an area that hasn't you know that they've been hit with a disaster and they're suffering and you come in and you can help them and they're grateful to see you and they're crying or maybe you know you might med medevac somebody out there that saves their life you know that is very fulfilling you know and and you feel very relevant and important and that's where a lot of it comes from I can't personally do that for extended periods of time because I burn out. I, I last about three weeks and then I physically just, I, I run out of energy. I run out of steam. Um, but if I could do it full time, I would do it full time all the time. It's just very fulfilling. Wonderful. Wow. Well, you, I can't remember if it was Haiti uh, or where was this? Or Japan, Mike? When you were there, when a man was rescued from the rubble, he had been living, he'd been buried for a few weeks. Why don't you share that? And then how CNN picked up your image, and you know how it got blasted across the world instantly, and you know how he lived, and and your uh, connection with him now. So, at the end of the of Haiti, so I was in Haiti for about three weeks, and I got there about a it was within the first week, so four weeks. After the earthquake, we were staying at this hospital. We would sleep in one of the rooms, and there was a large crowd that had gathered downstairs, and I went down to see what was happening because sometimes these little riots would break out, you know, and so I'd kind of like shoo everybody away or whatnot. But there was somebody they had they had just brought out of the rubble, you know, right from the market right around the corner. So this is 28 days after the earthquake, and they bring this guy in who's alive, and, and apparently he had been buried in the rubble for four weeks. And, you know, you don't, you're not sure to believe this or not, but he was so emaciated. I mean, he was just completely like skin and bones, you know. And so I took a picture of him. I took one picture on my cell phone and I sent it to my assistant. And I said, post this on the blog and post this on my CNN. I report they're saying this guy 
is still a lot, you know, they just brought him in and he lived in the rubble for four weeks. So initially, um, CNN has this thing called I report where people can report events and whatnot. And CNN saw it and they called me and they're like, are you sure, you know, this is what you saw? And, and I said, yeah, I think, I think this is real. We sent him to another hospital, but they, they rushed some people over to that hospital and verified with the doctors. And the doctors said that they believed it was true. And they did more research and they found out that it was true that this guy had found a way to survive for four weeks buried under all this rubble and somebody just so happened to find him when they were cleaning up the market. Uh, he essentially had a little trickle, a little stream of sewage water that was kind of uh, flowing down by his body and he would take his hand and dip it in there and lick the sewage water. And that's how the guy survived. Um, incredible will to survive. You know, he's basically in a coffin. He had no traumatic injuries that, you know, bone crushing or uh, infections or anything like that. His skin had started kind of wearing off, but otherwise he was, in, he was in pretty good health. But he had to go undergo psychological um, treatment. Last I heard, uh he was delirious. He described being delirious, you know, through the ordeal and, and stuff. But his name was, I think he got confusion on last name, Evan Monsgrace, I think it was. Um, I haven't heard much about him for a while, but I know he's alive and he's re he's recovered. Wow. Would you say that's the most important thing you've witnessed in all of your volunteer work? I think that's probably the most amazing thing I've seen in terms of like a miracle. Uh, I think that's pretty, it's ranks up there. It's pretty, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've never seen anything like that. What else? What is another, uh, amazing, you know, act you've witnessed <clears throat> while being out there? Um, I think probably the most crazy thing coincidence wise was it was actually, it, we went down to help with hurricanes, Ivan and Katrina. I don't, I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> this story um ivan hit we went down to pensacola to help clean up just with the church group and we basically helped this family clean up their yard and they were just desperate for help so we we helped them out and, and we went home didn't think a whole lot of it and then katrina hit and we went to uh this is a year later we went to hattiesburg mississippi and and we was working on a house and sure enough this guy in his truck pulls up and he gets out and he's just couldn't believe what he was seeing. And it was the man from Pensacola and Hattie, <laughs> Hattiesburg and Pensacola are, are very far apart from each other. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so what had happened was, um, when he, re he, when the second hurricane hit, he remembered that we had helped him and he figured that people in Hattiesburg, Mississippi needed help. And he decided to get in his truck and drive up and, felt like he needed to turn down a certain road and there we were the same people who had helped him. I mean, the, the chances of a coincidence like that are just insane. And it's sort of like, I, I saw that as kind of like proof that even a little bit of help matters and it has impact on people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That is that, incredible. That was crazy. Um, but a lot of the stuff that we do is just, it's really just simple grinding hard work you know it may be unloading three tons of food off of a truck you know and that's going to feed uh, a group I, I think it's it was amazing when i went to the philippines a um, bunch of my friends raised a, a lot of money and we bought some food and, and fed basically a town up there for a month that was amazing to me you know it's not it, it may not seem as miraculous but that to me is a miracle to be able to reach out and help somebody I don't know. Definitely. What about Nepal? Nepal was your recent, most recent trip. Is that right? That's right. About a year ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what were some of the, the best experiences and also the most dangerous experiences there? And actually, I think you may have shared the most dangerous, but maybe there's another one. And then some of the, you know, the friendships made. Sure. I try to hook up with a translator everywhere I go, usually a local person. So I, I develop very close relationships with, with this interpreter. It's, it's always <laughs> a younger guy, anywhere from 25 to 35, speaks English, 
knows the culture, knows that he speaks perfect English, you know, in perfect native language, and they become my my right hand man. I've I've developed great relationships with all of those each each one of them. Um, Nepal was was hard because the country had limited helicopters in the beginning. And so when I first got there, we had to make a decision on whether or not to hike up to these mountains where, where we heard these villages were. That was pretty, for me, it was kind of scary because nobody was going up there. Um, and we had to drive out there and then hike up there over a period of three, you know, three or four days. And that was, that was exciting and, and scary, but in the end it turned out to be so worth it. And on that hike, uh, there was a, a crippled man, you know, just kind of sleeping on the road next to this little path that would go up the mountain and, uh, nobody was taking care of him. He had, he had a little bottle of water, but he was physically living in his filth. Nobody was washing him. Nobody was taking care of him. Well, anyway, we walk, we walked past him on the way up and then two or three days later, we come down and he hadn't moved an inch, you know, he was still there and clearly suffering, you know? And so I could not stop thinking about this guy. How can we help this guy? You know, nobody's helping him. And so we did some research and we asked around and, and found out that his brother had, had supposed to be taking care of him. And long story short, um, we went out and cleaned this guy, gave him a bath, found his brother and told him, if you don't take care of your brother, we're going to come find you, you know, and it didn't feel like it was enough. You know, it's like, what can we do for this guy? You know, he's in an area where there's landslides. He's not really being fed. He's miserable. And long story short, through my aid organization, we raised some money and found a, a care center for him in Kathmandu. And then through the other aid organizations like um, uh, Salvation Army and, you know, the, the Fishtail Air, the helicopter a company that we were working with arranged to have this guy evacuated. And I po I've posted that on YouTube as well. This, this guy's evacuation and his name's Gokul found him a home. He's still in the home to this day. He's, he's getting his care. He's being taken care of. He's being looked at and he can stay there. I've told him we will support him as long as he needs that care. And if he wants to go back, we'll take him back, you know, but as far as I know, he's, he's pretty happy, you know, he's eating and you know, that was very rewarding. Yeah. I mean, dang. See, folks, I mean, here's a here's what's really a seemingly ordinary guy. Uh, Mike, I met him in college. And uh, you know, just look what you do. I mean, you're touching really it's one life at a time. But, you know, that is going to spread and and they'll you know touch their kids or they'll be able to have children. And I mean, it's great work you're doing. So I, I, I love I love the, I love the Thank stories. You. And 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 then reading, you know, three weeks in Haiti, I think uh I encourage the readers to look, to read that because you're actually going to learn some very practical skills about how to prepare for disasters. And, uh, and then you're going to learn things about friendship and then the struggles you went through and all the red tape and, mm -hmm. you know, yada, yada, all kinds of stuff. Crazy. Um, so so uh, maybe on a lighter side, what's the longest you've gone without a shower? <laughs> uh, it was probably, like a real shower, I think it's 10 days. And that was in Haiti. And the problem with Haiti was that you're, it's very hot and humid and you're constantly sweating. So 10 days of sweating without a shower. And, and so it was really, <laughs> I, I, I mean, after the second and third day, you can kind of smell yourself stink, you know, after the fourth and fifth day, it's just so overwhelming. You can't smell it anymore. It just, it's very strange. But I was <laughs> filthy, filthy. And, and, uh, one of the Salvation Army guys who I later became like one of my really good friends, Craig Arnold, he was staying in a hotel, fortunately for him. And he said, look, come take a shower at my place. And so I took a shower. But even after coming home from Haiti for weeks, the dirt was still coming off. <laughs> yes. Haiti's a dirty place. It's just a lot of dirt, a lot of dust, you know, it's part of it. Hey, I wanted to tell you this other story. I don't know if you got time for yeah, it. Yeah, go for it. Um, a couple thoughts that came to mind was that I think people, I think in general, people might doubt how much good one person can do, and that was kind of a theme in 
uh, three weeks in Haiti was I had some doubts in terms of like, what can I do? You know, what kind of impact can I have? And, and in this, in that, in that book, we talk about that girl who would have died if we didn't, you know, find that orphanage and connect her with somebody. And so when you, when you save somebody's life or you alleviate their suffering, it really is proof to you that one person can have a huge impact, you know, for good. And another example of this was in Japan, we had pulled over on the side of the road and there was a family sitting there going through the rubble, you know, their home. And they were kind of like huddled up together and we started talking to them and they were just miserable. You know, they didn't, the government wasn't going to help him when they lost everything. He was a fisherman. He lost his boat. They didn't have any income. And we decided to, to focus on this one family. So sometimes, you know, in, in the disaster aid world, you're supposed to help everybody equally, you know, without um, any hesitation in regards to their their age, their race, their religion. Their, the aid is available to everybody, you know. That's how it's supposed to go on an international UN level. But sometimes there are these opportunities to help specific individuals, you know, and so we just decided we're going to help this guy, you know, we're going to help him out. So what we did is we just spent like a week, we would go out and help him clean and, you know, we help him get a new boat and, and long story short, when we had found, he told us this later, when we had found him, his family, as a family, they were discussing how they were going to kill themselves honorably. Wow. And it was, when we told us this, we were like, What? But that comes back to this victim mentality of, you know, that's how they felt, feel, you know, having lived through a disaster. But when you kind of help them, you know, get them going, it's like a spark. And when they get going and they're like, okay, hey, these, you know, these people care, they're going to help me. And they start getting their own momentum. What happens is that person starts to help his neighbor and that neighbor helps his neighbor. And so it's a very logarithmic um you know, result where, where you help this one person, which in turn will result in hundreds or even thousands of people getting help because of the example that they received, you know, the stranger came and helped me. This is how I should help my neighbor, you know? And so that was something that had come to mind. I've seen that many times is when the victim makes the transition to leader and they just start going out. Uh, the, you know, the guy that I work with in Nepal, um, his name's Pradeep. He's still going out and doing service on his own. This is something he, you know, no one's telling him to do it or he's not getting paid for it, but it's just very contagious, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. That's a great point. I guess I'd never thought about that. And you, and you just illustrated it, you know, with a guy that from Pensacola that went to Hattiesburg mm -hmm. and then this other guy. So, yeah, I guess yep. that's happened multiple times and many times that you don't even know. I'm sure I'm I'm sure that's the case but it's it's happened enough to me that I know even you know in the United States not even during a disaster if you know somebody that truly needs help that's an interesting conversation yeah yeah you know uh and you're able to help that person it can have a very trans transmorbid you know it, it can really change them it can change you and you should never doubt the the amount of power that comes from helping somebody who really needs it. Um, in, in disasters, that is a very touchy thing because you're going to have hundreds of thousands of people that all need help, and some need it more than others. So you might have somebody who's living in a shelter who's lost his home. He doesn't have any clothes, but when you compare him to the guy living in the rubble, he's a king. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that even from day to day, it changes who needs what more. And you have to use very uh, wise judgment in terms of who gets the help and, and who doesn't. And it's, it can cause problems sometimes bottlenecks. And anyway, that's a whole, that's a whole other story. But anyway, you know, I, I know I've lived through a pretty bad disaster and that was uh, Tuscaloosa 2011, April 27th. And uh, it was a pretty bad scene. I mean, I, for my neck of the woods, my part of town didn't get touched, but you know, as the crow flies just a, you know, a couple miles, I mean, it was just, it was just a war zone. And uh, you and I talked the day after that happened and, 
and you said, should I come? And I remember, I think I remember telling you, I, I don't think so, Mike. I mean, it's, it seems very well organized. And, and obviously, we, we weren't dealing with thousands of lives lost. I don't remember how many deaths there were. But uh, there were definitely some deaths, and it was a horrible, horrible scene. But I think the city really responded well. And, you know, you see that some sometimes... You know, the flooding in Nashville several years ago. I mean, some cities respond well and people don't play the victim mentality. Mm -hmm. But there's also sometimes people that genuinely need help. And there's sometimes there's people who are just sitting back saying, okay, okay, government, what are you going to do? And when are you yeah. going to help me? Yeah. Tuscaloosa was, was hard for, for me to make a decision on because I what, you know, I'd lived there for nine years. I knew I had a lot of friends there. Um, but... It was. It, I kind of looked at the situation and knew that there were enough access points and enough people that could get there, and also the expense of of doing these trips. It's very expensive to do. You know, I pay for this out of my own pocket up until Nepal, and it's a little bit of annual. I had a little bit of donations, but um, it was a matter of a little bit of expense and also knowing that there was enough resources getting to Tuscaloosa that made, made me say, okay, maybe this, this is something I could probably not go to. Um, I, I burn out very quickly in disasters. So after about three weeks, I become ineffective. I, I lose the ability to talk at some points because I'm so, so tired and other people, you know, that the Salvation Army brings in, they're, they're, they're kind of like slow burners. They'll be good for eight or 12 weeks. It's just, you know, how, I don't know, it has to do some, something with their intensity, the intensity of the person. But I'm very good at the start of it. You know, when things are chaotic and there's a lot of pressure, I'm really, really good for three weeks and then I'm done. Um, but Tuscaloosa, you know, you know, in the United States, we have a lot of very well organized groups from churches to fire departments to police departments from other areas that are more than willing to get in their cars and drive and and that's what we've seen with Katrina. We saw it with 9-11. We've seen it with lots of disasters. I, you know, I don't want to sound biased or anything, but Americans are really good at stepping up to the plate. They really are. Other countries, maybe not as much, you know. Um, but when the, like when we were in the Philippines, I love Filipinos, by the way. They are some of the nicest, kindest, coolest people you will ever meet but they have there's something about an american coming into the philippines i think it has to do with general macarthur you know when when he helped liberate them from japan but they really listened to me you know they they would organize if i told them but if i didn't tell them it was maybe not as clear you know but once they were <laughs> once they were told they they would know how to do it but i you know I guess that's the thing is I'm coming back to is there's this, there's always these victims. And I think about this one guy in the Philippines, grown man, completely healthy, no injuries. And we're like, Hey, we need you to come help us unload this truck. And he's just like, I can't, I'm a victim. It was crazy to me. You know, he had just decided that he, what, what are you going to do for me? And there are people who will, I hate to say this, they're predatory in disaster situations. Um, in Pensacola, there were, there were groups going down there gouging the victims for tree removal. So trees fall over on the houses. How do you get the tree off the house? Well, this company shows up and says, we'll take it, we'll take a tree off your house for five grand each. And there's so many houses that have this problem that you have to pay them the money to, if you want to clean up your yard. And so we see a lot of this, um, victimization where people are saying, I am a victim, you must help me. And there's also people who go and prey on them saying, mm -hmm. look, you know, if you want your house to not leak water, it's going to be 20 grand to fix your roof. They have no choice just because of supply and demand. The demand is so high. There's no one else that'll do it. So we see both sides of that. And, um, I think the, the people who do best in disaster situations are the ones who have accepted the role of taking care of themselves. They, they've accepted that before it's happened and the ones who do the worst are the ones who sit back and wait for somebody to come help them. Wow. Yeah, that's great insight. Life lessons there. I agree with that. 
Um, so really what aspects of disasters do you feel that victims in general are most unprepared for and what's the best advice you can give them to avoid it? I think, uh, taking on, okay. So what in the United States, and this is something I, I've tried to talk to, to friend, I've tried to talk to you about it is that we don't, society doesn't understand how fragile we are. <laughs> okay. Uh, because if a major disaster happens, 911 is not coming to help you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if something happens within 30 minutes, all of our services, police department, fire department, ambulances, 911, they are not coming to help you. If it's bad enough, you are on your own. That is probably psychologically the biggest problem as that we have in the States is because we have a very good response uh, program in 911 and ambulances and, and getting aid out. And if something's wrong, you know, you can call the cops and they'll be there. That's not going to happen in a disaster. If a disaster happens, you are not going to be able to get on your, get in your car and drive to the gas station. Why? Because there's going to be a line from here, you know, for miles away, you may not even be able to get on the road. And so that's something that I think, in, in the states we're, we're most unprepared for is that uh, we don't know what's coming, and when it does come, we're not going to be ready for it. Yeah, I agree. W- what are the most important preparation items that we can have? Uh, there's a few things that come to mind. Uh, the first thing is that you have to accept that you alone are responsible for yourself and your family. The police are not responsible for you. Uh, the ambulance is not responsible for you. Those are tools that our society has given us to kind of help. But in the end, you have to be self-reliant. You know, if somebody's breaking into your house, it's not the cop's responsibility to come and save you. You know, that's like the secondary plan. It's your responsibility to take care of yourself. You know, call the cops, get them there as fast as you can, but they may not be there for five or 10 or 15 minutes. What are you going to do in the meantime? You know, so that first mentality is that you are responsible for yourself is the first thing. The second thing is, is to have many plans for what will go wrong, whether you're going to stay or whether you are going to flee, depending on the disaster. So have a plan to stay, have a plan to defend your home with violence if necessary have a plan to escape, not by car, um, and have resources like a generator. Electricity is something that's going to be taken away in a disaster. You're going to lose power. It's a, another thing that we're kind of spoiled with. So how will you generate power? How will you get clean water? Uh, I think families should have some sort of storage, at least enough for everybody for a week minimum. But the most important single item a family or a parent can have in their home in case of a disaster is a, is a firearm, a gun. And sometimes people are surprised when I say that, but what happens is, and we saw this in Katrina was, was within 24 hours of, uh, you know, social services breaking down. There's armed looting, which means someone could come home to home, door to door, and rob you blind because the cops are not going to come to protect you. So I always tell people the first thing you should have is probably a pistol. Um, I'm a fan of a Glock 19. You can use that for home defense. You can carry it on your person just for, to, for self defense of your family, your home. That's going to be the most important thing because you know, you just don't know what you're going to meet uh, person wise in a disaster. So have a gun, know how to use it. Teach everybody in the family who's competent and able to use it. And then the second thing I would say is have a means to escape not related to your car. Something like a bike or a horse. I know horses aren't really um, an easy thing to make. In a disaster, a horse is the ultimate form of transportation. It really is. But I think a bicycle is a really good idea to have around your home because you can really ride a bike for, you know, 50, 100 miles, and that would get you out of the situation if if the roads are blocked or if uh, there's no gas or something of that nature. 
the thing with preparing is you can prepare for everything and still not be ready. I'm, I consider myself very prepared and I know that I'm still not ready for what might happen, you, you know, but at least I have some plans. At least I have some tools to, to help me and, and some ideas. But yeah, if you stay and defend, have a weapon, preferably one for each person in the house, um, have a way to get electricity, whether it's through generators or solar power, have an alternate source for water and have a, a, some sort of food storage if you decide to stay. And, and then if you decide to leave, if you can get away in your car, great. If not, have a bike. Those That's probably some of the best advice I can give people right there. That's good. Uh, and, and I mean, this is not far-fetched. I mean, the, we've seen these things happen and you've lived through them many times, Mike, as a volunteer. And uh, I guess, have you lived through a natural disaster maybe as, as a, an initial victim? Uh, you, are you asking me, have I lived through yeah, one? Yeah. I, I mean, I've been in aftershocks, you know, so I'm very familiar with what an earthquake feels like. And I've probably been through, this is going to sound crazy, 20 something plus earthquakes or aftershocks. Um, I haven't been in an actual disaster that I was actually suffered from it, but I think the mentality is pretty applicable that you just decide you're not going to be a victim. And if there's a disaster and there's a tremendous opportunity to, to do good, nothing can stop you. Yeah. You know? So I think once somebody has accepted that, no, you can't rely on the police or, or whoever to come save you, that's a great place to start. Um, you know, and, and I, some people are upset when I tell them to, to own a firearm and, you know, they should be trained with it, but really, uh, you can't see what's coming and you don't know when it's going to come. And that's the one thing that you are really going to wish you, you want, you wanted to have, if you didn't plan for it. everything else you might be able to get after, you know, but a gun, I've wanted to have a gun, you know, when the, uh, when that drug dealer jumped in the back of our truck with us, I desperately wanted one. You know, and, and to have that feeling of wanting a gun and not having one, it's hmm. a sense of helplessness, you know, that you can't defend yourself or to have somebody trying to beat your door down and you can't defend yourself. It's very, uh, it's a terrifying feeling if you don't have something like that to do it. So I, I emphasize that I like the Glock 19s because they're, they're, they're high capacity. They're easy. They don't mal malfunction. They're very tough you can throw them in the mud and they're going to work and um it's a it's a good gun to shoot but i also say you should be trained on it if so, i mean if you're a homeowner and you don't own a, a gun i think you're crazy you know i do yeah. i think it's that's just insanity everybody should have a gun yeah. that is able mentally and physically to, to operate it yeah it's one of those things where you hope you never have to use it but exactly yeah, yeah exactly I, I, i've got one i'm ready in fact a glock 19 is my weapon of choice uh, or well, yes, yeah, my top weapon of choice, and and so uh, I hope that if I'm ever, if the need ever rises, that I don't hesitate. But I will, because I want to take care of my family. I will protect my family. I've got small kids and a wife. Uh, you have a go bag, and so you're ready 24/7. You have to be. It would mean you you'd be hypocritical if you weren't given your your business. I mean, so what are some things in your go bag? And, and also, particularly, what about your, your clothes, too? Because you talked about, you know, sweating a lot, going many days without showering. So, yeah, yeah, what type of material do you wear and what's in your bag? So, I have two go bags now. One is full of basically MREs, uh, meal ready to eat. Those are the military meals. They have about a seven-year shelf life. Um, I usually, it's, it can be as much as 50 pounds of it. And I, I bring just the meals uh, to eat because when we go into these situations, sometimes food's not readily available or the victims need it. So whenever I go in, I kind of assume that w I have to take care of myself for three weeks. So that includes all of my clothing, all, all of my food. I try not to bring as much water because water is heavy, but I do bring water filters with me. So if I needed to filter water and drink, which I have had to do, in fact, in Vanuatu and in Nepal, there were several times that we, I mean, that was the only way to go is to filter water, you know, we're, we're going to dehydrate. Um, in my go bag, I have 
a very small two-man tent. I have a hammock that can be uh, suspended between two trees. So I have shelter. I have three changes of clothing in in a dry bag and a few extra pairs of like shirts and underwear. I'm trying to think what else I have. I have a couple knives, very particular about the knives that I bring. I have a Leatherman. I have headlamps. Satellite phone, very important. I have two different satellite phones. I usually bring both of them now. Satellite phones work anywhere in the world without, you know, internet. And so I use those constantly. I bring solar chargers to charge battery packs. So if I'm out in the jungle for a week, I have electricity for my phones, for my iPhone. I bring usually two iPhones to GPS tag and to keep notes. I use the iPhones as a as a camera and a video recorder. I don't bring my cameras anymore. My professional cameras I leave behind because they're just too heavy. Um, and I want to interrupt you a minute. Though. Have sure. you had any problems getting through security at airports with, with any of these items? <laughs> yeah, and, I should probably, what do you do? I should probably say that I do not bring guns with me. Although, if I had my choice, I would. I would mm-hmm. definitely bring, yeah. bring guns if I could. I can't bring them into other countries if I want to get there quickly, you know, um, and even then it may be impossible, but it, when I went to Japan, I, you know, I usually have like three knives and sometimes I'll bring like a, a rescuer's, uh, tool. It's sort of like an ax that has a crowbar built into it, you know, just different things. And when I went to Japan, you know, I just threw it in my bag and went, Well, it turns out all of those things are illegal in Japan. You know, I didn't know, that you can't have a, a knife over, so I think it's like two inches long or, or an inch and a half long blade. It's something stupid. And, uh, you know, they x-ray your bags when you come in and, and for whatever reason, they didn't give me any problems. And so I just went through and, and I remember I dropped my knife once on a, on a job and somebody saw it and it's this huge knife, you know, and, and the, the Japanese guy was freaking out. He's like, that's illegal. You can't have that, you know? And I just, smiled and put it in my pocket but I, i've never had any problems in the airports um bringing gear in i just say hey here are my credentials i'm here you know with salvation army or red lightning and almost always they let me through no problem wow they, they want you there you know some countries i've seen like i hate to say this i, I probably shouldn't say but there are some countries <laughs> that will try to uh tax the aid responders as they come in try to make money off of them. It's crazy. In, in Haiti, we sent, the Salvation Army sent a bunch, of seven containers of aid that sat in the docks for six months because the, the fees that they were being taxed was just crazy. And so sometimes we see that. Initially, the, the country or the government will let aid in and then and then they want to start collecting taxes on it. It's, it's just absurd. Wow. There's a lot of corruption that goes on. I hate to say that, but there, there's, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good, mostly good organizations, but there are some really shady things that go on that we rarely hear about, you know, in, in the newspapers and in public, you know, how funds are used and how donations are used and where the money goes. And all I would say is before you donate to any group money is to research them on a website called charity navigator and that lists their financials. Take a look at their CEO. How much is the CEO paying themselves? You know, in, in uh, at the time in Haiti, I think the CEO of one of the biggest organizations was taking like $1.5 million, you know? So there's some different trains of thoughts on this. You know, they have to make the big salary to run a big group, but I just don't believe that. I mean, I don't take any money for what I do. There's no reason somebody should be taking $1.5 million for running a charity. It's yeah, just, right. You know? Well, Mike, we're running up on an hour really close to it, and uh, so, there's there's several more things I want to get to, and I think we can. Uh, okay, maybe so I'll, just... try to, try to, I'll try to keep it short. Sorry well, this is very, very good information. We could actually make it two episodes, so <laughs> I think we'll try to keep it to one or maybe have you back later and we can elaborate on some stuff. Uh, but, but how can – someone get involved in, in disaster relief like what you do or not even to your level? I would say volunteering locally at a, even just like a soup kitchen or with their church or maybe a local organization and tell them to pay attention to how they feel. 
when they're serving their fellow man. And if they feel that fire lighting, like, hey, this is really awesome, then it's something they should take to the next level and, and join. A group. There's search and rescue teams that they can sign up with and join. But the problem is, is people want to serve the day after the disaster happens. And by then, it's too late. If you, if you want to do disaster aid work, you have to sign up and train long before the disaster happens. You know what I mean? Hmm. So what I would recommend is just to start off volunteering and pay attention to how you feel emotionally. And if it feels like it's something that's, that's really, you know, something you want to do, then pursue it further. But a disaster tourist packing up and going over and left, unless you have special skill sets, like you're a doctor or a nurse, I would not recommend you putting yourself in danger. Do not do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's that. great advice. Well, contrast how you feel when you're there serving in the thick of it versus once you're, you know, the day or two after you're home, what's the, what's the, the different emotions that you feel? Uh, I feel when I'm there, I, I, I'm reminded of what blessings I have to live in the United States. And when I come back, there's usually about two days of decompression where I'm not really with it mentally anymore. I just kind of sleep in, watch Netflix, you know, and eat. But when you come back, I mean, you, you have a tremendous amount of gratitude for things like running water. You know, that's something we would never think about unless it was taken away from you. But if you live in a sweaty tent for three weeks, you're going to really be thrilled to have hot running water or to be able to drink out of the faucet. How amazing is that? And all of the thing, the little things that typically stress you out from your job or Facebook or whatever, you know, that rattles you, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't get to you anymore because you've seen people suffering, real suffering, you know? So it's tremendously beneficial to a, a person to reset kind of their soul. That's the way I look at it. Okay. Good advice. Uh, Mike, in closing, um, when my little brother Mark was killed, in September of 2010, uh, you were, I believe you were in Haiti. Is that yeah. correct? Yep. Second trip. So tell us how you got the news about Mark. Cause you and he were very close. And then, uh, I'd like you to talk briefly about your, you know, making it back to Haleyville uh, in time for the funeral, because you played a huge role there for us. You took some incredible pictures that we never would have had. And um, th that obviously are just priceless to us to this day. So I'd like you just to touch on that and how you found out and how you made it back in time. I found out uh, we were doing, we were working on a project of photography video and we had just finished a shoot and I had gotten a text message from one of our mutual friends, Chase Layton. And he had told me and that's how I first found out. And then you, you called me shortly. I mean, within minutes you called me. The problem at that time was I had committed to go back to Haiti to organize a team to get these containers of, of aid out. And so I, I, I felt like I had to go. I couldn't tell him no because without me, there was no security team. And um, I, we talked about this, but I, you know, I decided I had to do it. So went to Haiti, and we organized the group. We got the containers, a lot of red tape and paperwork and scouting and stuff like that. But what had happened was we I kind of felt like everything that I could have done was on its way to finishing. And it was, let me think, it was a day before his funeral. And I said, I remember sitting in this meeting and I just told Craig, who was with me, I said, I feel like I have to go to Alabama right away. And sometimes that happens. I get these really strong impressions that I need to go somewhere or do something and I can't say no to it. And he just looked at me and he said, well, then you got to go. Got online, bought my ticket. The next morning I was on a plane, traveled all day, made it to Birmingham, got in a car, drove up. And I, I mean, I literally got to the funeral maybe an hour before mm -hmm. you, you guys pulled up. And um, that was the right decision. I mean, looking back on it, I think I would have definitely regretted not, not going and participating. It was good for me too, because I was, I was not in a good place emotionally after that happened with Mark. I cried for days, you know, when Mark died, 
And, um, that helped that, that helped a lot of my personal healing, seeing you guys and seeing how you guys were handling it and being with you. That was, that was just very healing. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's what happened, but you know, I, I miss Mark. I was, I think about him all the time. It's, it's been coming up on six years now, but you know, I just wish I could talk to him again and hang out with him. And I'm sure you miss him and your family miss him much more than I possibly could, but yeah, we love Mark. Yeah. And, and, and for the, so the listeners know, I mean, Mark is the reason why I started this podcast because I've met so many people who are just great Americans. And of course I already knew you, Mike, but this is something that, uh, so I'm not just interviewing military. There's, there's plenty of people who didn't serve, who can't serve, whatever the reason is in the military. Uh, but I wanted to highlight people everywhere that you just normally wouldn't hear about. And, um, you can read about Mike in Mark's book. Uh, Mike, he's, is, it's, yeah, he's labeled as Michael Andrew. Uh, Mark's book, My Brother in Arms. Uh, you really got there. I remember us, we were driving from the funeral home to the high school where the funeral was. And you were standing outside there at the corner of the school. And I remember my mom we were rolling down the window and saying, Mike, Mike. And she was so happy to see you. And you were out there taking pictures, I think. Yeah. And I, I think you jumped in the car with us. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Um, you probably you probably had stopped and bought a white shirt from Walmart. <laughs> yeah. uh, you probably still reeked. I don't remember that, <laughs> but you probably did. Um, but man, it, what a great! I'm so glad you were there. And and yeah, it does. It gets a little emotional uh, just thinking about it because you and Mark spent so much time together. And um, and then the, the, just what you did for us with the, with the pictures, and you went you 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 stayed you stayed with us for. You stayed with my parents for a while. You went up to Pope, uh, up to North Carolina with us. So uh, you saw a lot of really some intimate moments and and captured them too. So so really, I can't well, thank, thank you, you enough for that. Oh, my pleasure, my honor, absolutely. Uh, you are really a great American, Mike. And uh, there's a whole other side to you that we didn't really get to see on the <laughs> you on know, here. You, the humor, your your dating tips, uh, all kinds of good stuff, but. Um, Really, how, how can people find out? Who, how can people follow you and find out more about you and more about uh, your organization, Red Lightning? Everything about you. All my all all of my social media. I am Michael the Maven. Whether it's uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, my website is michaelthemaven.com, and then the disaster website is Red Lightning. Just the way it sounds, with no space. Redlightning.com is my aid organization and haven't updated it for a while, but we post some of the work that we do and, and we're working on some special projects. I can't really get into obviously for different reasons, but hopefully want to have a bigger impact than what I'm doing now. And, and maybe it'll take 10 years, but it's something I'm working away on. And, and in the meantime, just getting ready for, I'm ready for the next disaster. If it happens tonight, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Yeah. I you know? believe that. I know that. Uh, so folks, please, uh, if you have any questions for Mike, please contact him with the the several options that he gave. Uh, he's pretty easy to find online. Um, also, please send me any comments or, or uh, any suggestions, any questions for Mike. You can send them to me as well. But thank you for listening to Patriot to the Core. Uh, tune in next week for another, hopefully another captivating uh, interview like we've had today. And uh, Mike, I look forward to talking to you and actually seeing you sometime soon, hopefully. <laughs> I, I need to get out there to see you guys. Then it's been a while. But thank you so much for having me on the show, Thad. I really appreciate it, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Great. Till next time.